Praise the Lord, saints. We give God thanks for honor and for glory. And we are asking him to watch over us tonight and to build us in this area of grace and truth. So tonight, as we get into our lessons, again, the lesson will be from the 14th chapter of Zacharias, which again will help us to understand what God has in mind for his people. And it will also help us to understand the Bible and the way in which it's scheduled. I say scheduled, you know, it's set up in, in a sort of way that truly the words of God, as it says, he knows the end from the beginning. So what he is showing us here, even in the Old Testament, he is showing us what the end will be. And it is for us to open our minds and to seek to know and to understand what God is doing and the way he is working with us. So we are going to deal with a few verses from the book of Zechariah, and we are going to be able to, to get into some other scriptures. This will send us into the 47th chapter of, of Ezekiel, which will again open a way for us to understand the goodness of God and the plans that he has for us so that we'll be able to truly walk and walk aright and doing those things that are acceptable in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, and as we seek your face, we ask you to turn us not away empty-handed, neither forsake us, O God, of our salvation. But be with us in all our undertakings and help us to be all that we can be for you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So what I would like you to do, you know, is as you're preparing yourselves, if you are going to follow with me in the word, we are going to deal with a few verses from the 14th chapter of Zechariah. And then we are going to go into some other scriptures. Two main scriptures that we will attend to is Amos, and just a verse in Amos, the first chapter, it was because it's telling us something there. And we need to understand what it's really saying to us. So this is why I'm going there with you in the almighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So tonight we start off with the book of Zechariah. Trust in God for grace and trust in him for mercy and asking him to have his own way in our lives so that we can be all that he wants us to be so that we can find the joy and, and be willing to search the word of God and to see what he is saying to us and why he is saying what he is saying. This is so important, church, because sometimes even me or even I, we look at the word sometimes and we just override it. But it's telling us such a great story. It's helping us to know who God is. And as we look at the book of Zechariah, and we watch from the fifth verse, it's something for us to think about. And let's think about it in a very positive way because it's telling us a story that sometimes we never looked into, but we need to. And hear what it says here, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountain. For the valley of the mountain shall ye reach unto Azel, and ye shall flee like as he fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. This is prophetically speaking and telling us some things that is going to happen. That valley that we're speaking of there is the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is a valley that stands or, or, or is lying between the Mount of Olive, where Jesus will place his feet on one side of the north and the other side, which is the south. And there is where he will stand. And in standing there, something miraculous is going to happen. And according to the book of Revelation, it says when they come down against us, uh, even in the book of Ezekiel, Gog and Magog coming to fight against the children of God. And that mountain is going to split. That mountain is going to split and that valley shall be filled with blood. 
Fire and brimstone will devour the enemies of the Lord. And this is why we have to be so careful as we read. It's telling us something here tonight, and we need to understand. I'm saying to you tonight that it is only God's people that will escape the punishment on that day. Remember what we were studying in the book of Micah. When the day of the Lord shall come. Are we going to be ready? Are we going to be prepared? And sometimes we look at us insufficient, you know. Well, why me? Why, why the Lord using me? But remember the words of Isaiah. Remember the words of Jeremiah. He said, send me, Lord. When the question was asked, who will stand? He said, send me. So the cry here to us should be, send me, Lord. And you would see this here as we even look in the book of Amos. I'm not sending you there right now. The words of, the, the words of Amos. Now we have to study who, when we begin to read, hello, Jesus, thank you. When we begin to read these words, and what I'm trying to do is to encourage you. You are not too small. You are not too insufficient. You are not too weak. To really tell the world how sweet the name of Jesus song. You would observe as I'm dealing with the minor prophets here. They are the ones used. Now when you look at Amos and you begin to study the life of Amos. You will realize that Amos was one who mined a lot of sheep. He was a shepherd boy. He planted garden. He was a farmer. And I want you to go back a bit into the. The, these areas and, and where God called his people from. And why God called them the way in which he did. When we look at David, where did God call David from? God called David from among the sheepfold. Moses, the meekest man that ever lived. According to God, his words. These are the words of God that I'm speaking to you here. He said Moses was the meekest among men. But yet still, coming from what you would call a, a autocracy, you know, living a high life, prince being a prince in Egypt, yet still, in order to fulfill and to perform the work of the Lord, Moses had to go through a process of preparation. And that process was he had to know what it meant to be a shepherd boy. He had to understand what it meant when these ewes crying out at night. When they're ready to give birth and they're crying out. And the coyotes and the, the wolves coming after them. And he had to, to protect them. This was a symbol of them protecting us. And this is a symbol of us looking out and reaching out for God's people. So this is why we have to share these words the way in which we are sharing it. And it's not just the hallelujah, praise the Lord, but we must understand. So when we look at Amos here, who was a member of the southern kingdom. Remember that Israel were divided northern and southern. And all of this came because of Solomon's son, who couldn't understand how to deal with people. And what I'm saying to you here, this is why they had to go through some processes. The leaders of the day, David had to understand what it means to be I'm in the sheepfold. Moses had to do the same. Our father Abraham had to understand what it means to go through starvation. You know, after the... Hello, Jesus, I thank you. I want you to know this. Thank you, Jesus. The moment that Abraham was called to be the leader and the father of nations, when you go back into the next chapter, the 13th chapter, you will see that there was the greatest the earth in all Israel, in all the land at the time, with the exception of Egypt and the, those areas there. The greatest the earth, and when I say the greatest the earth, I'm speaking of the greatest farming. He was called 
to leave Babylon, Iraq, the land of his birth, you know, according to the scripture, he said, they say, Abraham the Syrian, but Abraham was called from Babylon, from Iraq. So when we really study the word, but he was not a Syrian. Maybe a Syrian by, by accepting or, you know, getting your, as we call it here, you get your green card. But you know, he knew what it meant. And this is why God had to prepare him in order to be able to be the father of nations. And he had to go through some processes that he had to lie. He hiding behind a mango tree looking for Sarah because he lied. But then did he really lie? Sarah was his sister, half sister. But yet still, when we lack the faith in God and he has to prepare us, he allows us to go through certain things and you would realize that when Pharaoh took Sarah into his house and preparing her so that he could be with her, God speak to him. Touch not that woman. And this is how our father Abraham came out of Egypt more wealthier than he went in. Because Pharaoh feared God. Because he felt that he was God. Ra, I am Ra, the sun God. But when he really felt the power of the most high God, he sent and called Abraham. He said, why didn't you tell me I might have taken her for wife and the God of heaven would have destroyed me? He called all his men and said, touch them not, but give unto them X, Y, and Z, and they had given unto them a belief. God has a purpose. And you would remember me for saying, God always punishes with a plan. He allowed him to go. Did God tell Abraham to get up and go into Egypt? No. So the battle here that is taking place and the message here that is being given, God is showing that he is going to bring us back to himself. God is showing that there is going to be healing in the land. God is showing that there is going to be peace in the land. But the choices you make, you are going to live with that. Until I'm ready to deliver you. Or until you're ready to lift your eyes to the hills from whence cometh our help. So as we are looking here, the preparation. The northern kingdom were ten and the southern kingdom were two separated. But God is going to use Amos, a member of the southern kingdom, a shepherd boy, to go and preach now unto the northern kingdom and tell them, thus saith the Lord. One of the things that we have to see here, and as I've been bringing, bringing the message to you and showing you that, listen, there came a time when Judah when the northern kingdom was in its full, I mean, political power and begin to forget the God of heaven. They were desecrating that place that Jacob called Bethel, where he saw that stone, where he laid on that stone and he anointed that stone. And you know, understand what Bethel means? Bethel here means the gateway to heaven because that's where he, he lay and he, he saw the heavens open and there was a ladder with angels ascending and descending. You know, this is something so powerful and serious in our lives because this is what God is saying. For us to know him, we have to seek to learn of him. And Amos began to make known unto them what God said. And to let them know that it is time that you turn to God and denounce the idols. Denounce the religious corp uh, corruption. This is what we are seeing today. I'm speaking here of the religious corruption that is taking place among us in secret. Many of us are still, you know, just as Ezekiel was called by God and said, look through that hole, punch in the hole in the wall and see what they are doing on the other side. You see, they are pointing at you, but they are not realizing that God is watching them. And I want to tell you something. Let God be your guardian. Let God be your guide. Let him direct your path so that you can find that peace. 
Amos was sent by God, a shepherd boy. And you know what he did? A ship, he was a ship. He grew figs and he mined sheep. This was his job. He grew figs, not the banana that we speak of here. The figs of, of the yeast is, is a different fig, it's a fruit. And there was a season, and when that season come, you know, you, that's where you make your money. And that was a very sad tree that Jesus, as he walked by the way, for his, teaching his disciples as he go along. And as they went, Jesus looked on the tree. You know, church, so, so many things are going through my mind right now. You know, and this is what we see today. When Jesus looked on that fig tree, from a distance, the leaves are green. The leaves are beautiful. And oh man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some good figs to eat today. And when he reached there, it was barren. All it had was green leaves. All it had was green leaves. And what did he say? No man will eat of you after this. He didn't say it as, as a boastful to them, to his disciples. But Peter heard. And on, on the way back, when Peter realized that the tree was dried up, he began to question himself. Because he remembered, Jesus said, no man shall eat of you. And then going back, what a mystery is this? This is who we are. This is who we are as children of the Most High. This is why we are called the way in which we are called. So when Amos was sent, who was not a prophet, neither was he a Levi. Yes, he was a prophet. I mean, when God called him and began to, to speak to him, and he began to speak to them, the minor, one, of, uh, one of the minor prophets. But he didn't grow up in that manner. But God called him, and God used him. And what I'm saying to you tonight is that God can use each and every one of us if we allow him. If we allowed him, and I'll show you that as we go into the, the book of, of, Hez, of Ezekiel. You know, Ezekiel had to, to go through certain things and experience certain things in life in order to be the person that he could have been. And you would realize as we read in the book of Amos here, especially in the first verse, where he says he was from Tekoa. Tekoa is his hometown. And in that country, the country of sheep and goat, that's where he's from. And that's what he did. And if we look carefully today, there are still areas in the world that you are see, seeing shepherds, thousands of sheep. And it's a whole family that is taking care. It, it, this, is, this, is a look, this is very lucrative. You know? This is a very good business. You know, today our young men do not want to go back into agriculture. Everybody wants to be something, you know, sit in an office. But the time is going to come. When you have to go back to the field. And it is necessary that you make your mind up and be willing to work and to serve God. Again, this spiritual job that God is calling you to is to prepare you. And whatever it takes, whether you be a nurse, whether you be, be a, a yard keeper, whatever, wherever God points you, if your mind is stayed on him, you will find peace. I am saying to you, you will find peace. So what we are seeing here in the book of Zechariah, he said, as and ye shall flee. What I'm telling you is that it's only the children of God that is going to be saved at that time. And we have to be ready and we have to be prepared for it. So all we have to do is to walk accordingly. All we have to do is to give God our hearts and seek him. As the angels, you know, Understand who we are. You know, sometimes we just stand up here and we want to say, in the name of Jesus, and you have no anointing. In the name of Jesus, and you have no calling. Be careful 
the seven sons of Scavia, they were doing the same thing. And the enemy turned and rented them. And in those days when they cut the butt off your pants and send you back into the village, it's a shame. Shave your beard. Cut the butt off your pants and back into the village. Everybody, they shame now. Because you went to do certain things that you have no authority over. But God is speaking in this time and in this area. And I'm asking you to be watchful. I'm asking you to be careful. I'm asking you to help us to walk in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we can find that peace. But look at all of this that God is warning these people about and trying to bring them to a knowledge of truth. Hear what it says in the sixth verse. And it shall come to pass in that day. Church is not going to be an easy thing. So do not take this work easy and don't look at it. Don't try to, to magnify it the way you want. Let God magnify you. Remember what he said to Joshua. He said, I will magnify you in the presence of the children of Israel. Let God do the magnifying. You don't magnify yourself like that fig tree with all this green up around and looking good. But nothing inside. We have to be very careful. So this is what he's saying. It shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. The light shall not be clear nor dark. We know what it is when we get up and we see a cloudy day. And especially in the southern area. Here now in Texas and all these places where all these tornadoes are taking place. And you know, look at what is happening in Iowa. You see, a whole village I mean, no you're not even seeing street lights. Everything went flat. We have to think again. God is speaking. God is speaking. And I want you as a child of God not to get tired, not to get weary of well-doing. Continue. Sometimes even on the program, you know, I watch how they, 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 they work with the program, you know, sometimes. They don't even show it sometimes. But that's okay. I cannot get weary. I have to keep pressing on. This is important for you and I. I'm not just telling that to you. It's for me also. I have to take the time. As you have to take the time. You see, and it shall come to pass in that day. It shall neither, the day, the daylight, the day shall neither be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Not day, nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. God is going to do it. Is this reminding you of anything? Let us think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. And from the third hour, I want you to think spiritual. From the third hour of the day, something happened. Darkness. Until the ninth hour. And there was a stillness, there was a quietness. All that day. After the rain and the thunder crack, darkness overshadowed. This is the day of the crucifixion of our Lord. But what was happening within that darkness is what we should seek to know today. And this is what he said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you knock, it shall be opened. If you ask, it shall receive. But today we are walking with a book in our hands and we are not seeking to understand what is written and what we are carrying in our hand. Meditate, church, and focus. Because when you are meditating on the, on the word of the Lord, you know, I remember that night I was reading from the book of Jeremiah. He said, what God shut, no man can open. And what God opened, no man can shut. And you know, I'm meditating. I went to bed with that on my mind. And in the midst of the night, and at that time too, I was fasting. And in the midst of the night, someone opened my door 
It's more to this, but we, enough is enough. Someone opened my door. And it seemed as though I was right there at the door, and he said to me, you was writing a letter? And I just turned and took the letter up and handed it to him. He read it, and he closed back my door. How did he do that? These are the things that we have to sit back and understand and try to meditate upon and stop just claiming and, and you know, sometimes we could decree, but I want you to know something. Decree when the anointing to decree is upon you. Not when you feel you could decree. I decree in the name of Jesus. And we have to stop fooling people. When the anointing is upon you, work. As when the anointing was upon Peter and John. And that man by the gate of beautiful. is not every day Peter and John healed a crippled man. A man who was crippled for 40 years. A man who had had to be carried and to be placed. And this is what the lesson is saying to us here. We have to be very careful as we go. Sometimes it takes me a little further on. But I give God a praise. You see? And when the message came to the children of Israel, not very long after, it was about 40 years after. You see, time with God is like an evening gone. It was about 40 years after that the children of the north was, con listen, they were carried away into Babylon. Nobody heard. Why nobody heard? Because their political standing was so powerful. They had a good economy. Everything was going good with them. And this is what is happening with us. Let us remind ourselves, when we sick, we look for the doctor. But while we are well, we don't even take a little purge. We don't even take anything. I'm trying to say something to you. And you're eating all what you're eating, and it, you know it's not good. Let's take care of ourselves. When we in a situation, we look for the man of God, and as things begin to go good again, we don't even look for the man of God. We have no time for him until we are in problem again. And this is what was happening to the children of Israel. Hence the reason we had the northern and the southern kingdom separated because of greed, economic, you know. When the young man was told, listen, lighten the burden upon the people, but don't burden them as your father did. He did not. And this is what we continue to do. Sometimes I want you to think about yourself. What would you like for yourself? And this is what God is asking us here. Let us be careful and let us walk wise, not as the children of Israel walked in the day of Uzziah and all these kings that went away from the precepts of God. Let us seek to hold on to the hem of his garment that we would be blessed. Look at what the seventh verse is saying. But it shall come to pass in that day, which shall be known to the Lord in that day. Listen. It shall be, it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not a day, not day, nor night, but it shall come to pass that in the evening there shall be light. You will be going through changes in life. You will be experiencing certain things in life. Sometimes it's darker than sometimes. Sometimes it's all going smooth. It seems as though everything you do just working out for you. And then it have days when it's it, it just gets in. What did I do? What did I do? And you know that you are praying morning, noon, and night, but God still wants to see. Because there's so much to bring out of us. There's so much for him to, to learn of us. Or for us to learn about ourselves because he knows all things. He is the author of all things. But all of this here is prepping us. If when you read this lesson carefully, he is prepping us 
so that we can and observe where he stood to teach us on the Mount of Olives. And that is what I'm speaking to you a while ago when I said the valley. He stand on one foot on the either side of the mountain and the mountain just separated. And imagine seeing this man of God standing on the mountain and the mountain moving from east, from north to south. And he is just being stretched with the mountain and nothing is happening to him. I am that I am. There is none beside me and before me there was none. I am the Lord of the whole earth. I have created and I will destroy. This is who God is. This is who God is. Look at this ninth, this eighth verse here of the very book of Zechariah. Look at what it's saying here. The former sea and the hinder sea refer to the dead sea. Hear what it says. I want you to know that. And it shall be in that day that the living water shall go out from Jerusalem. Half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea. In summer and in winter it shall be. You know what God is saying here? You know what he is really telling us here? I want you to know. He is speaking here of the Dead Sea. That water that would flow according to the book of, of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, that is flowing from the right side of the throne of God. And it will be flowing right back into that Dead Sea and everything. That's why I told you we would go to the book of... I want to go there a little bit. Let's go there a little bit. The book of Ezekiel. And see what it's saying to us. So that we can get a, a good idea. You know church. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Ezekiel 47. In the name of Jesus Christ. This is why sometimes you know. We have to go here a little. There a little. Line upon line. And precepts upon precepts. Hold on a minute because these pages are so thin, but we will get it. Hear what Ezekiel had to go through. And this is going through the process of being prepared to help the children of Israel to come to a greater knowledge of truth. And so that we today would be able to look back on these areas of scripture and help ourselves and others. Hear what it says. And afterwards... You know, sometimes we say we go to the house of God and we, we go and take a light and we do so many things. And sometimes we come back without seeing anything, without hearing anything. We have to prepare ourselves well. Hear what it says here. I want you to know something. This is why I'm saying, afterwards he brought me again onto the door of the house. But what, what afterwards we are speaking of here? What afterwards we are speaking of here? Then said he unto me, the 24th verse of the 46th chapter. Then said he unto me, These are the places of them that boil, where the ministers of the house shall boil the sacrifice of the people. This is plenty here. This is so much here. For you and for me. He says so much here for you and for me. But he's explaining certain things. He said and after that. The areas where the sacrifice will be boiled. Of the people. Afterwards he brought me again. Unto the door of the house. And behold. Waters. Issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. The threshold of the house and the water from the threshold of the house eastward. So which means it's, you know, something here. Because the, the, the cleaving of the mountain is going to be from the east to the west. When we say the cleaving, when I say the cleaving, you know, this, the spreading of the mountain is going to be from north to west. But the crack, there is a crack 
church. You know, when I study all of these things and I look into it and I realize what God is doing and how he is doing what he is doing, it's so marvelous. Because some of us will say, how could he stand there and how this mountain is going to divide? But geologically, they have just found that there is a fault line running under that mountain, the Mount of Olives, from east to west. So there is no doubt. And when that earthquake should, should take place, great things are going to happen. I say great things are going to happen. And on that moment, many of us shall be saved. Afterwards, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, water issue from under the threshold of the house eastward. From the front of the house stood toward, for the front of the house stood towards the east. The front of the house stood towards the east. Sometimes it makes you wonder. How is God operating? And what is he doing? From the front of the house, listen what it says here. And afterwards he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, water issue from under the, the threshold of the house eastward. So which mean? The front of the house was facing the east. When we are looking for the Lord, he is coming from the east. This is what it's saying here. For the front of the house stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, and the, at the south of the altar. And if I should stand at this altar here, where is, my, where is the south? This is the east, and the water is flowing this way. This is why we say sometimes we're going south. You know, as you begin to grow older in life, you begin to grow more mature in life, you're not going to the north again, because from the north comes the living water. And we are going south. We are about to lay this body down. So from here, we are standing, looking forward to God. But this is beautiful when we look at it carefully. Then the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the gate of the north. Are you hearing what, what I'm saying? The water flows, comes down. Because that's where the, the listen, that's where the, you, you see, we, we call it the icy mountain. Everything in our lives today is really depicting the word of God. You see, when the, the ice cap begins to melt, where is the ice cap? The ice cap is the north. And what this water here really represents is life. I remember most, um, Jacob, Job being asked, could you tell me about the icy mountains? Could you explain that to me? And no, it couldn't be. And this is what we have to look at here. Then they brought me again. Brought me out the way of the north and led me away. Led me, in the, led me about the way without under the outer gate by the way that looked towards the east. But this is what I like in this lesson. And behold, the water ran on the right side. And when the man had the line, listen, and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubic and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the anchor. I want to tell you what this is really speaking and what this is really saying to us. The waters, as you enter in, and this is why I'm saying to you, you are not too small. You are not too insufficient. But this is what it means. We should grow. The water here is life. And the life, and we're speaking here of the life of the spirit. The life of the spirit. This is important here for us to see.
We must be able to understand what is being said here. And when he brought, when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubic and he brought me to the water, through the water, the water was to the ankle. You are no newborn babe. You have now given your life. You are turning it all over to God. Except you go and jump in the river, you might end up in the deep. But if you are entering the river, it starts at a level. And this river that we are speaking of here is the river of life. Pure water. And when we read the 22nd chapter of Revelation, it tells you the water was clear as crystal. Pure water. I'd reach his ankle as he entered. Today, those of us, as soon as you, you come in, you, you have no experience, but you believe that you know it all. And God is warning us. It takes time. To grow in the spirit is like a baby. And Paul tells us, when we enter, we become as newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk. So we have to take it one step at a time. But look at what is going to happen here. The fourth verse, and again he measured another thousand. And brought me to the water, and the waters were to the knees. Are we growing? Are we growing, or is it that we are just... You know, you know, sometimes I wonder, some people believe that Adam was created a big man. When God created Adam, Adam was a big, tall man walking. But there is a difference between creation and forming. And we're going to deal with that one day. There are many who are afraid, to, they don't like to talk about these areas of scripture, but these are areas of scripture for us to learn and to understand who God and who God is and how he is dealing with us. So we see in here the water begin to grow. The water begin to build up. And this is how we should be. Again, this is true, the desiring of the sentient word. When we begin to desire the sincere word, it comes so we are at a, a point now where we, we want more. We want more. So we are looking now to end up, to go into the inner court. We are looking to, to you know, how can I do it? Fasting, meditating, all of these things. But reading and researching and laying back and meditating and waiting on the Lord is going to help us to get there. So the water was up to his knees. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. He's not letting him go by himself, but he is taking him through. But there will come a time when he is going to let you be on your own because you have work to do. But some of us are still calling ourselves babes. You cannot be babe when you're eating dumpling. Baby cannot eat dumpling. So we have to know what we are doing. He said, and now this time, at this time, according to the fourth verse, when the water was up to the knee, and again measured he had, but observed to every time, he is taking you to a different level. The water was up to his loins. So you, you know you're going in the water, and you have to be able to measure your depth where you feel comfortable. You have to be able to walk in there and know that if there's anything I could easily get out of here. And if you find that the current is too, too heavy for you, you, you need to stand up and brace yourself. And this is what is happening. Check on your little boy or your little girl and you're taking them to the sea for the first time. I mean, they have some brave little children. They'll see it and you have to be careful with them because you don't want them to drown. And you're taking him in. And the water, you know, you're feeling the chill of the water. And he begin to understand, well, this is different. This is not like the bathtub. This is not in the house. This is different. And he's going in and then you could stand with him and get him clementized. 
And this is what the spiritual build-up is all about. We need to build ourselves. But at this point, the water is at the loins. So imagine what Ezekiel, this is a spiritual process that Ezekiel is going through. Listen, I want to tell you something. Ezekiel is not going through this process in the flesh. Ezekiel is on the river bank of Cheba or wherever he was in his room and meditating. Listen, and God taking him out of self. This is, this is deep, you know. And now he is experiencing all of these things to come back with a message just as you would look here and you would see when Amos, nobody knew him to be a prophet, but now all of a sudden he's walking and preaching the word of God and telling the northern kingdom to turn from your evil ways and, and don't get yourself all tied up in your political gimmicks. You know, and we have politics in the church too. No, I, church, this is very serious here. I want to read a footnote here for you. And Amos was a shepherd and fig grower, a shepherd and fig grower from the southern kingdom of Judah. But he prophesied to the northern kingdom. Israel, the 12 tribes, the, the, at least it was 10 because the other two formed the southern kingdom. And hear what it says here. This is a footnote that I'm sharing with you. Israel was politically at the height of its power with a prosperous economy. But the nation was spiritually corrupt. Idols. I want to read that for you again, certain parts. Israel was politically at the height of its power with a prosperous economy, but the nation was spiritually corrupt. The nation was spiritually corrupt. The worshiping of idols. We come in and bowing down before this, whatever this piece of stone, and we, we kissing the stone feet, and we, we, we genuflect into this piece of stone. Listen, I know it might sound bad, but this is what it is. Jesus himself said in one of the Psalms and, and some of the books, he said, listen, you pray into a piece of, that have hands and cannot move, that have mouth and cannot speak, have eyes and cannot see, have ears and cannot hear. What are you doing? Can you make the green ass, the, listen, the wild ass bring? If you are looking for something, look up and trust him. Who made the heaven and earth and the same one who could snatch our lives come here it's time to go home you had enough here it's time to go why are we humbling and bowing down so this is what is going on here the Bethel is listen corrupt spiritually corrupt idols were the worship to be the nation's religious center. Idols. And the religious center was better. And if we know anything about better, Jacob, when it was time for him to go back after Diana was, was seduced, and the sons of Jacob got angry, and decided to create havoc in that area. And when Jacob recognized what was going on, God speak to him. And God said, get up and go back to Bethel. But they must cleanse themselves from all that they was doing. And there came a time when they had to take all the earrings from the ears. I don't like to speak about this because we get angry. I know some of you saying you get it in the spirit, but I'm, I'm questioning you. Genesis 25. And they had to strip themselves from all the things of the heathens 
and place it under that oak tree before they could end up into Bethel. They had to purge themselves. And if we have to reach the place where we need to be, we have to cleanse ourselves. Some of us look like that fig tree, so beautiful and green, so powerful. And I'm coming believing that I'm going to get fig. But when Jesus reached there, he said, no man should eat of thee anymore. So we have to be very wise as we walk and understand what it means to give unto God. So now the water I'm speaking here of growing in the spirit and afterwards he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen waters to swim in a river could not be passed over. This is why sometimes when we sit and we are moving in the spirit of God, some will say all manner of things about you. But when God is guiding you, because there were some things that Ezekiel had to do here that even the elders did not understand. Even the elders did not understand what he was doing and why he was doing it. There were times when you have to do certain things. And there are those of us who believe that we know it all. They fail to even ask you a question as to why you are doing what you are doing. But they condemn you. I am saying to you, Amos, from being a fig grower, and that's all he planted according to this, this, the history of his life, a fig grower and raising the, his sheep, now being called from the tribe of Judah to go back and tell the other ten tribes. Thus said the Lord. Forget all this political thing that you are doing. And come to me. Cleanse yourself. Worship God. Jeremiah been telling them. Return to God. Give it up. But Ezekiah refused. And he began to walk in his own way until the king of Babylon surrounded the city, blocked all the water wells so they couldn't get nothing into the city, and then carried him away in fretters. Seventy years was pronounced upon them. We have to understand what God is doing. So when we are called, being called to grow in the spirit, I want you to know what is really being said here. He said a river, it became a river that we could not pass over. And this is what it says, when we, have, when we are growing in the spirit to different levels, to different heights, and are seeing certain things, and beholding certain things, then we would know that there is a life beyond this life. It's not how intellectual you are, but it's how spiritual you have become in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not how much nice words you can speak here, but that I can say to you and make you feel good. I'm not here for that. But I want you to know that as we grow in the spirit, our understanding of God will bring us to another level whereby we will be able to submit unto him and ask him to have his own way. So I am calling out to you tonight. Where are you? You entered into the, into the, 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 the river. The water was at your ankle. 
Where are you today? You have how many thousand feet you have walked? Where did it reach? Is it at your knee? Are you making that next thousand feet so that it can reach to your loins? Oh, am I afraid? Oh, I afraid the water. I afraid of this. And this is how fearful we are. But the only fear that we need here to know is what is written above there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is the fear. Not who can destroy this body. But let the God of heaven guide your path. And this is what Ezekiel is doing here. Now, if you don't want to swim, you're going to drown. So he had to swim. And he began to swim. And he said unto me, the sixth verse of the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. So he don't give you more than you can bear. So he's asking you now, are you ready for this? And this is what is happening. Are we really ready for this? Are we ready to walk with the Lord in the light of his word? When we are called, are we ready to fulfill his calling? The duties that he had placed upon our shoulders. Well, there comes a time when with all the niceties and, and, and the power and, you know, I'm, to every time I'm in this lesson, it takes me back to Dives and Lazarus. All the sumptuous meals and it will going to reach that point where the very meals or the things that you like is going to be dangerous for you at some given point and time. So I'm asking you today, so let us think again and let us understand what God and how God is calling us and why he is calling us the way in which he is calling us. Look at what Zacharias, the ninth verse says. And this, then we will really understand what God is really doing for us. Let us look at the ninth verse in the name of Jesus. So we are back in our chapter. Listen. Hear what the nine verse says here. And the Lord, you see, when I'm speaking to you, I'm sharing with you what is going to happen. You, you see, this river that is about to send living water and that dead sea that is about to come to life and everything that flows into it would live again. God is preparing a way for you. And hear what he is saying here. And the Lord shall be king over the whole earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord, and his name is one. In that day there shall be one Lord, and his name is one. The God of this, and the God of that, and the God of that, and this God of that. Observe what the word of God is saying here. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. You heard what he said to Cyrus, king of Persia, when Cyrus glorified God? He said, God has given me the kingdom of the whole earth. And remember, he can place it into anybody's care and keeping until he's ready to call us home. So his name is one. He have his angels and they will work with us. And we ought to be able to recognize and work with them. Because he questioned us in Hebrew 1 verses 13 and 14. And he said, to which of the angels said I at any time, sit at my right hand. And in reference to this, he was speaking of his son, Jesus Christ, who is sitting at his right hand. And who is making intercession for you and for me? And who is going to bring us to the point 
whereby we can truly say, truly, the God of heaven is alive. We must be able to do that, church. We must be able to give unto him as we ought to. And this is why God has created us. And there are times I would bring back these scriptures to you because I would like you to, to remember them. Hebrew 1 and verses 13. You see, so when I say something, I want you to know that I'm, I'm speaking according to the scriptures. And this is why I said, the angels, the messengers of God will speak with us. You know, some of us, we grow so thin now because you read in, in, in the book of Zechariah where it says, his name shall be one. But you're not hearing what the word of God is saying to you. So you, you become so tunnel vision. You cannot see here. Peripheral. You have no peripheral vision. And we need that. We need that. And observe how the angels speak to us. Mary. Well, I don't know a man, so how am I going to have a child? Okay, Mary. The Holy Ghost shall overshadow thee. And when the Holy Ghost, what is the purpose of the Holy Ghost overshadowing thee? Listen, who have no sin cast the first stone? Just remember, the power of the Most High is about to come down and place something, that thing in the womb, Mary, and that thing shall be called the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God. It wasn't God who speak to Mary. The angels who stayed back, they don't have a choice but to do what they are told. They don't have a choice. So listen, Mary, this is what's going to happen. So the Holy Ghost has to come and make sure and sanctify that body. And then the power of the Most High will overshadow that body. This is not with sensation. This is not what you're talking about here. And this place, that spirit, which is going to take on form and become flesh. And this is, the, you know the angels could do this too? The angels of God could do this. And Jesus made it clear. He said, be careful because, the, the, listen, they will be transforming themselves as angels of light. But we have to know the angels of light. And any angel that cannot confess that Jesus Christ was sent in the flesh is not of God. So this is how you know the angels of light. So you don't just walk out there and because he come looking holy, you ask a question, in the name of Jesus, who are you? Sometimes it's so simple that you don't even understand how powerful it is. And this is what is happening here. In this lesson here, the 13th verse of this first chapter of Hebrew. To which, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand? Which one? No one. But he said it to his son. Ezekiel also saw him at the right hand of the father. He says, sit, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. None did he say that to. But he said it to his son. Here will we continue to, to help you to understand where we are. And we have that light. God gave us that opportunity to communicate with the angels. And if they are told that if the angels cannot confess that Jesus Christ was sent in the flesh, it took means to communicate, whether it be telepathic or, or however we communicate, but we have a line of communication, and this is what is going on here between you and I tonight. He said, are they not all ministering spirits sent for to minister for them who are heirs of salvation, you and I? We are heirs of salvation and they are going to speak with us. They are going to help us to understand and to learn of the mysteries of the Most High or the mysteries of the kingdom. 
or the mysteries of God. And this is why you become that living water. You are not called just to be a tree, but to be a tree that would bring life to others and to help them to see and to know that Jesus is Lord. So I say to you tonight, God bless you all. Thank you all for being with me. Thank you all very much. And I want to deal a bit with faith on our next line of study. And I'm encouraging you to go into it because I'm going to be taking it more or less from the book of Romans, the fourth chapter, which is going to help us to understand. So if you are going to get there, you must know how to get there. And do not walk the street being over-righteous. And you know, do not walk believing everything that I do. You, I'm so wrong. You know, everything you do, you, you're so fearful that you cannot even worship, you cannot even praise God. I want you to be able to praise God and to give him thanks. So may God bless each and every one of you tonight. Again, and I'm saying thank you all for being with me. Thank you all for sharing this moment. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and also for your comments. God bless you. Have a good night.